One of the increasingly valuable commodities in our economy isn't a thing. You can't actually buy it or even touch it. It's attention. Corporations, political parties, sports teams, all of us as individuals want attention. The demands on it are so vast that we pay less and less of it to more and more things. Matthew Crawford has written a book about the price we pay for our shortened and splintered attention spans. So let's pay some serious attention to him now. Here's Matthew Crawford, fellow at the University of Virginia's Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture and the author of The World Beyond Your Head on Becoming an Individual in an Age of Distraction. Good to have you north of the 49th parallel, as they say. Thanks for coming up from the USA. Thanks for having me. Can we start with that subtitle, On Becoming an Individual in an Age of Distraction? What makes this an age of distraction? Mm. Well, it seems like we're, we're living through a kind of cultural crisis of attention, uh, a widespread sense of mental fragmentation, um, a sense that our attention is not simply ours to direct as we want. And I think it often makes us feel that what's at stake is something really big, something like uh, whether it will be possible to maintain a coherent self, uh, just a self that's able to act according to settled purposes and ongoing projects rather than flitting around. I know what we're distracted by, right? All the screens, the shows, the, I mean, everything in life, okay? What are we distracted from in your view? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think our distractibility, one way you could read it is that it means we're agnostic on the question of what is worth paying attention to, that is, what to value. Um, and if you look at it that way, I think it is the tip of a much larger cultural iceberg, which is a kind of crisis of values uh, where we're not sure exactly where we stand. Talk about that some more. What are we missing out on by ignoring this uh by not following the values you think we should? Well, it's not so much that I have a set of values to prescribe, um, but um, the, one of the sort of key ideas in the book is that of agency, that is doing things. And um, we often hear that the way to sort of fight distraction is simply by self-regulating, by being more disciplined in, in excluding things. Um, I think the more promising strategy, I mean, certainly self-regulation is crucial at certain junctures, but I think uh, in the bigger picture, more promising is to become absorbed in some worthy project that elicits our active involvement. Um, you think we don't do this anymore? Well, I think that experience of individual agency has become somewhat elusive. Um, you know, so much of life has gotten de-skilled. We've outsourced the making of things to other countries and the fixing of things often to immigrant guest workers. Um, and of course, a lot of our possessions don't invite tinkering and taking them apart. So I, the, the occasions for being directly responsible for your own physical environment seem to have gotten fewer. Um, and so there's a creeping sense of passivity and dependence um, and that's, that's where this experience of agency becomes somewhat elusive, I think. But we've invented dishwashers because theoretically we didn't want to spend the time at the sink after dinner. And we've invented washers and dryers because theoretically we didn't want to spend, okay, you get where I'm going with this. Yeah. So aren't we therefore more free and more independent thanks to the fact that we do less with our hands? Well, certainly the progress of technology has opened up all kinds of uh, areas for human endeavor that wouldn't be possible at all. I, I love to ride motorcycles, so there's a bit of technology that I'm very fond of. Um, it's also, you mentioned freedom, sort of these things freeing us. That's certainly true. It's also true that I think the language of freedom has become the language of marketing. Um, so there's a sort of sly appropriation of this our most cherished ideal, really, of freedom. So the credit card offer says, you know, no limits, you're in charge. And um, to free oneself from all of this liberation introduces a bit of cognitive dissonance. Um, so, uh, so in other words, I think we need a different concept than freedom when what we're talking about is trying to uh, overcome this sense of fragmentation. Well, it's not a bad point because in some respects, the dishwasher and the washer dryer and all of that has made us freer to sit on the couch and watch more TV, <laughs> which may not be what we should be striving for, right? 
Well, I think um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, there's some great TV on I these think, days. I, I think you're on it right now, sir. <laughs> say, but anyway, that's just me. I'm a little biased. Yeah. Um, so um, in, the, in the book, I offer these case studies of skilled practices. So I talk about the short order cook, um, hockey players, which you might appreciate up here. Big hit in Canada, for sure. Yeah. Um, motorcycle racers. Um, and people who build musical instruments. And what's interesting about these uh, case studies, you know, where I just spend a lot of time with people doing these things and talking to them, is that um, this, this perception of a skilled practitioner seems to get tuned to, uh, it's almost like an ecological niche of action that they begin to inhabit, such that the distracting proliferation of uh, choices is kind of narrowed and they get into a state of focus and when that happens the burden of sort of self-regulation is really made lighter it's it's no longer feels like discipline it almost feels like surrender or abandon to this um, this experience where you're savoring time I think it sort of slows down and dilates it's very pleasurable Pleasurable, but really hard to do. We are living in a world where there are more and more demands for our attention from more and more things, which at the end of the day, you may think are not particularly useful or valuable in the long run, but which are kind of a lot of fun in the short run. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what we do about this. Do you know what we do about this? Well, again, I think um, we can only go so far with self-regulation. And one reason for that is that um, we're constantly being addressed with very uh, appealing uh, forms of entertainment, for example, um, everything from video games to pornography. Um, so I make an analogy in the book, um, you know, food engineers have figured out how to make hyper palatable foods by controlling the levels of fat, sugar, and salt. So we get things like Cheetos. Um, and. I think distractibility could be regarded as the mental equivalent of obesity. Um, that is, human experience has become a highly engineered uh, thing. And just as um, broccoli can't compete with Cheetos, uh, similarly, the natural world begins to seem bland and tasteless compared to what's on offer. What does it say about us as human beings, though, that an entire room full of people all of whom know each other, can all be on their devices at once in their own little universes because whatever's happening in those devices is far more fascinating, apparently, than any of the other people that you are either in that elevator with, in that office with, in that classroom with, in whatever. Yeah. Are we boring now? Is that <laughs> it? Maybe. Well, right, maybe. Uh, uh, right. Um, and right, thank God for your phone if you are trapped um, within a boring uh, party, sort of discreetly looking down at it like that. But it's, you know, these things do crowd out other forms of engagement with uh, our surroundings and with other people. And I think one thing that's lost, uh, especially in public places, is the space for a certain kind of sociability. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm at the airport and waiting an hour for my plane, there's the chattering of CNN or whatever it may be. Um, and, um, you know, you can sort of avert your gaze and turn in your seat to try to avoid it, but um, the fields of view that haven't been claimed mm -hmm. for commerce are getting fewer and narrower. So one thing we do is, you know, people put on their headphones or bury their face in a, in a novel or a, or a device precisely to tune out the piped-in chatter, I think. But I think one thing that is lost there is this, the possibility of serendipitous encounters with yes. other people. Um, and that's a real loss. I mean, I think that's part of what makes cities exciting, is those encounters. I want to ask you about you for a bit, if I can, here. Sure. You started off as a philosophy student at the University of Chicago, and then shortly thereafter, quit and opened up a bike repair shop. I wouldn't have assumed those two things would have sort of, one would have led to another, but maybe I'm wrong. What happened? Well, I did a PhD in, in political philosophy at the University of Chicago, which I absolutely loved uh, my time in grad school. Um, couldn't find a teaching job and almost didn't really want one, I think. It, might, it was only sort of halfway in it. Um, but I did land a job at a think tank, 
which sounded like it would be great, a lot of thinking, I like to think. Um, but in fact, I hated it and quit the job after five months to open the bike shop. What did um, the bike shop do for you that the think tank didn't? <laughs> well, for one thing, um, so let me first describe the, the think tank. Um, Which one was it? I'm not going to say. I, yeah, I know, you didn't say it. And I wonder why. Yeah. Okay, anyway, yeah. go on. It's a distraction. Um, so like many policy places, it had taken certain positions which meant that there were some uh, facts that we were more fond of, let's say, than mm -hmm. other facts. And so I found myself making arguments that I didn't fully buy myself, and that was demoralizing. Um, and to make matters worse, my boss seemed intent on retraining me according to a certain cognitive style, I'll say. It was that of the uh, world of corporate lobbying. And the style demanded that you project an image of rationality, that was very important but not uh, indulge too much in actual thinking because it could sort of lead off in the wrong direction. Uh, and by way of contrast, uh, in fixing motorcycles, either it starts and it runs right uh, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, there's no weaseling your way out of the fact. So uh, you like the clarity of the bike shop? I like the clarity of it, yeah. Hmm. You don't make as much money, I bet, fixing bikes, though. No, no, it was not as much as uh, slinging uh, uh, stuff in Washington. <laughs> you do sing the praises, you told us earlier, of the short order cooks, the hockey players, the motorcycle riders, the glass makers, the organ makers. Mm -hmm. what, what do all of these people have in common, apparently? Well, I, I, I sort of st struggled to identify that, and I came up with the idea of ecologies of attention that are well ordered. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a kind of uh, gathering of one's mental energies to a point that really stands as a nice point of contrast to the kind of fragmentation that we, that we all complain about these days. And in all of these cases, um, there's room for progress in excellence. Um, they're the kind of pursuits where people really care about what they're doing, or they do if, if all goes well, and they sort of get initiated into an ethic of caring about what they're doing. And that seems to be usually by the example of some mentor who exemplifies that spirit of, of um, you know, try, really trying to get it right. Spirit of craftsmanship, maybe? Exactly. Is it yes. still alive today? It is. It really is. I mean, it's, um, it's not uh, trumpeted, um, it's, but it's something that if you're alert to it and are on the lookout for it, you'll find it. Did your mom or dad have it? My mom or dad? Yeah. Um, my dad, I think, very much. Yeah, he was a physicist. And, um, but he had that sense of craftsmanship? Well, he, 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 he uh, handy anyway. No, he was not handy. No, nope. um, he would build some some um, experimental apparatuses, but there was always like duct tape involved. <laughs> um, but he cared very much about getting the science right, and I think that's the same spirit. Did you inherit from him? I think so. Yeah, because you're pretty handy, right? Yeah. Yeah, you are. Uh, here you go again. This is a quote from the book: Someone who knows how to make things or fix things doesn't need to offer many chattering explanations of himself. He can simply point. Why do you prefer the pointing to the talking? I don't know. Well, for one thing, um, it's very easy to have a kind of self-deluded uh, view of yourself if you're not getting immediate feedback from the world. And one nice thing about physical things is that they provide that immediate feedback. If you get things wrong, they usually let you know right away. So you can only go so far down the path of self-delusion before you <laughs> find out about it. Can I ask you if there was, in that bike shop we talked about a moment ago, a kind of a eureka moment where you realized, uh, I love learning about what I'm doing right now in a way that I didn't love learning in a think tank where you would think lots of learning happens. Yeah. Was there a eureka moment? Um, you know, I never really, uh, it's not something I thought about until I decided to write an article about it, which then became that, that first book you're referring to. Um, but I will say that there, there was a very strong contrast with another white collar job I had, which was writing, um, summaries, abstracts of academic journal articles, which I thought would be a great job. I get to learn a lot about different fields. The problem was that there was a quota of writing 25 of these per day, which is simply impossible. So um, 
I was told to do it without, they, that you could do it without actually understanding the article. Just crank it out. It was just, it was nonsense. Huh. So um, I produced a lot of, a lot of real crap that way. <laughs> and um, Not terribly fulfilling. No, not at all. And it actually felt like it was damaging my ability to think. Whereas in, in fixing motorcycles, I'm, it's always, there's never a, a simply a recipe for doing it. It always requires improvisation and adaptability. So you feel like you're using your own judgment. Another quote from your book, World Beyond Your Head. It is said that what the economy demands is workers who are flexible. The ideal seems to be that they shouldn't be burdened with any particular set of skills or knowledge. What is wanted is a generic smartness, the kind one is certified to have by admission to an elite university. We are told the economy is in a state of radical flux. Disruption is spoken of as though it were a measure of value creation. And so, a 21st century education must form workers into material that is similarly indeterminate and disruptible. The less situated, the better. Let's unpack that a little bit. Sure. Generic smartness. You, you, kind of, you kind of spit it out like you know. in a pretty pejorative way. What's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with being smart, um, obviously. Um, but this, this sort of fetish of flexibility that you should be ready to reinvent yourself at any time. Um, that makes it hard to accumulate the kind of experience uh, that leads to real mastery. And it also makes it hard to compose a working life that has a kind of coherence to it. Um, people used to be valued in the workplace for what they've learned by doing something. Um, and so connected to this is in the fact that in education, apprenticeship is always criticized for being too narrow in education. What's wanted is something more sort of flexible and all-purpose. Mm. But um, when you go deep into some particular skill or art, it trains your powers of perception and concentration. You become more discerning about this particular class of objects. And um, if all goes well, I, I think you get initiated into this ethic of caring about what you're doing. I don't want to be too myopic this, but I'm going to... Let me give you an example here. The guys who are behind these cameras right now and doing the audio in the other room and switching, um, many of them came up as cameramen, audio technicians, switchers, and now they live in a world where they all have to do everything. And it speaks to what you were just saying, right? Everybody's got to be more flexible and be able to do everything, which means that the guys who actually were able to spend 30 years taking pictures can't do that anymore because they're doing pictures today and sound tomorrow and switching the next day, and that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. That's the world we live in now, Matthew. Is there anything we can do about that? Because it doesn't look like it from the way the arrow's pointing nowadays. Yeah, well, you don't want to be an idiot about these things and get too idealistic. Um, the, uh, you have to be able to, to earn a living. And, you know, always learning new things. I think you're right. I think it's, it's unavoidable. And in fact, it's pleasurable to learn new things. Um, but where it becomes a kind of um, mantra of management that everything should be sort of maximally disrupted all the time, that's when it becomes um, a real crock. You want to tell management that? <laughs> I will. I think you just did. Uh, you've been on this program before. Have I? Yes. I, I, I know you don't know that you have, but you have because, um, well, uh, we used a clip of one, one of your talks in the past uh, in one of our programs. And um, maybe should we do this now, Sheldon? Why don't we play this and then we'll come back and chat, shall we? Sure. Let's roll the clip. I think we've developed um, an educational monoculture in this country where anyone with even halfway decent test scores is getting hustled into a certain track where you end up working in an office. But some people, including I think some who are very smart, would rather be learning to build things or fix things. And why not honor that? That's the question. How do we, John, bring honor and prestige back to the kinds of jobs we're talking about tonight? If you want people to respect the trades, then you have to have teachers right through the system who respect the trades. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that most educators in our school system went through university. Many of them have never seen a trade shop. Many of them have never experienced the trades. It's, it's uh, society as a whole, so it's the parents, it's the school boards, 
it's the colleges, it's government. Uh, everybody has to be involved in uh, promoting the trades. So that's from a program we did almost a couple of years ago in Sudbury, Ontario, uh, which is about four hours north of here, biggest nickel deposits anywhere in the world. And we're trying, I guess society is trying to get parents to stop telling their children that they all have to be lawyers and doctors and so on and get them to appreciate the fact that learning to do something with your hands is a perfectly wonderful way to live and an acceptable way to live as well. But I'm not sure we're there yet. Are we there yet? I think Canada is actually further ahead than, than the states on this question. And I'm sure part of that is due to the fact that you have this natural resources boom, so there's such a huge demand. Mm -hmm. And I think this really does have to be um, always keyed into a, a, you know, a cold-eyed look at the economy. It, w it wouldn't do to you know, promote the trade simply because it's enjoyable. The, the point is to make a living. Um, but the fact is that you can make a good living in, in, well, not in every trade, but in some. I mean, welders are in very high demand, diesel mechanics. I would never tell a young person to become a, a framer or a drywall person because there's, there's no money in it. Um, it. Might be in Toronto. God, they build a lot of houses here. Yeah. They do. Um, so I think um, really the issue is that uh, because the work is dirty, it's easy to assume that it's also stupid. But in fact, say you're trying to diagnose why a car doesn't idle properly. That's not a trivial problem. And this really connects to the world beyond your head in that um, you're answering to standards that are external to the self, first of all, and that are not open to manipulation. And that has a kind of a grounding effect that I think does lend itself to a certain um, I don't know, calm. But I can't tell you how many times I've talked to parents who, when I ask them what their kids are up to, they say, well, he dropped out of you know, this prestigious, academically inclined line of study, and he wants to go to some community college and learn how to be a welder. And they say it with disappointment mm -hmm. and with sadness. Like, mm -hmm. well, I guess if that's what he wants to do, OK. How do, you, how do we get sort of, I'm older than you, but how do we get sort of our generation to to realize that it's actually okay to make a living with your hands these days? Well, I think, uh, again, the economic case is important. So you, you would hate to see your child make decisions that are going to impoverish them. Um, but again, I think um, a more appreciation for how cognitively rich that work can be can, can, in, uh, can enhance our appreciation of it. And if you've never tried to do uh, so say diagnose what's wrong with the machine before, it might be hard to, just to, to see how, um, how demanding it can be. Can it be fun? Well, it can, you can really beat your head against the wall for extended periods <laughs> of time. It can be painful. Um, but when you finally, if and when you finally break through and figure it out, that, those are the best moments for me. I've been known to run over and kick a garbage can just out of elation and finally cracking the nut. I hope you didn't break a toe when you were doing that. Only once. Only once, okay. Let's finish off on this. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, well-known political scientist, gave, you saw the review he gave for your first book, eh? Mm. Yeah, Shop Class is Soul Craft. He ends it on a pessimistic note. He gave a nice review, but he says, people are much too busy attending to their digital technologies. Shop Class, it appears, is already a distant historical memory, he says. Mm. Is he wrong about that? Well, at the time he wrote, it was probably about right. I think there's, there's been a bit of a renaissance of appreciation for, um, for the importance of um, learning the kind of skills that provide self-reliance, that provide a secure livelihood, especially the kind that can't be outsourced because it has to be done on site. Um, so I think we've maybe turned the corner on that a little bit. Um, and so, but he mentioned digital devices, so he's alluding to this problem of distraction. And mm -hmm. I think that really poses a more fundamental problem for education because uh, in order to become educated, you have to be able to concentrate on things that are not immediately engaging. And uh, if you're not able to do that, um, I worry that we're becoming more similar to one another because um, it's only when you develop the competencies that require that kind of um, focus that you become an individual, I think.
Did you get your PhD? I did. And you can build a deck? Sure. How many PhDs can build a deck? I, probably more than you might guess. I hope so. Yeah. The world beyond your head on becoming an individual in an age of distraction. Nothing distracting about this interview. We were very happy to give you the attention this deserves. Matthew Crawford, thanks for coming into TVO tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.